Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Today I'm going to be talking with you about uh, the effect of analytical methodology on the number and type of extractables and leachables identified in an extractable study. By way of introduction, Jordy Labs is a company that was founded in 1980 to provide high quality polymer analysis services. We provide a range of services including identification of unknowns, quantitation, extractables and leachables studies, and do a wide range of investigative analyses. We do over 1,500 projects annually and have our 80% degreed chemists. By way of overview, today I'm going to be um, talking to you about a study that we did on a series of samples uh, that included a, 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 a siloxane tubing set as well as some uh, pharmaceutical packaging materials. Uh, I'm going to describe for you the sample types, the extraction conditions that we used, and also the scouting results that were obtained when we did that study. I'm then going to get into the heart of my talk and I'm going to go over how the sample workup can affect the outcome of the study in terms of the number and type of extractables and leachables that are identified. And I'm going to point out some particular pitfalls that can occur uh, if good decisions aren't made during that process. Before I start, I just want to take a moment and describe what extractables and leachables are. Uh, extractables and leachables is a very important area of study because um, many of the packaging and um, and materials that we use today, the plastic materials, can leach different chemicals out of them and that can then get into the finished article, be it a pharmaceutical product, food product, or a medical device. Um, and so extractables and leachables consist of things like process impurities, residual monomers, oligomers, and side products of polymerization reactions. Uh, there's also a wide range of polymer additives that are commonly used, things like antioxidants, slip agents, lubricants, uh, you name it, there's a lot of different small molecules that are put in there on purpose for a function. Um, and also uh, there's uh, the oligomeric material itself from the polymer. Now one of the things that makes extractables and leachables an exciting area of study is the fact that many of these materials are not commercially available, uh, which makes them more difficult to analyze. And so things like reaction side products and, and some of the uh, degradation products of the antioxidants are not sold commercially and so looking for them and identifying them um, has unique challenges for that reason. In this slide I just show a, a generic overall workflow for an ENL study and you can see that it begins by collecting background information. And in order to design a good study we need to start with an understanding of what is my material and therefore how should I replicate the use conditions of that material. So that's a very important step in the process. We then uh, choose the analytical methods that we're going to use, the techniques, what, what instruments will we use to analyze the extract. And then we have to select the samples, and we want those samples to be representative of the actual material that's going to be used. And lastly, we will pick the extraction conditions. We will then uh, begin the chemical analysis, and this is the part of the talk that I'm going to focus on today. And in this section, we will prepare the samples and controls. We'll then subject them to extraction, and after we do those extractions, we will then um, analyze them with a series of scouting methods. Those scouting methods will help us to identify the type and amount of material that's in there without identifying individual extractables and leachables. We will then go further and do targeted methods that are going to look for and identify the individual extractable components. Then we'll do method development to develop quantitative methods and finally do quant of those components. Lastly, after we've collected the list of what's there and how much of what's there, we will do toxicological evaluation on those to determine if any of them pose a significant toxicological risk. So getting into uh, the, this particular experiment, uh, we analyzed a couple different sample types. The first was a silicone tubing, and that tubing um, is a component used in the manufacturing of pharmaceuticals. It's a pharmaceutical grade silicone tubing, and it was reported to be peroxide cured. Uh, we then also analyzed a pill bottle with a childproof cap and we used USP 1663 and 1664 as our guidance because this is a pharmaceutical product. Uh, this was reported to be an HDPE bottle with a polypropylene cap uh, and a pressure sensitive adhesive with a polystyrene liner was used. Finally, we also analyzed a sample that was a spray bottle with a pump. Again, this is a pharmaceutical um, grade uh, system and so we used USP 1663 and 1664 and followed that guidance. And this was reported to be a high-density polyethylene again with a polypropylene cap, 
but it also contained um, a glass check ball, um, check ball valve system for the pumping mechanism and had two metal springs inside. So uh, in this slide, I show you what solvents were used for the extractions. We, for the pill bottle with childproof cap, we used uh, a, a pain reliever as our um, example of a leachables condition. This would be an example of a medication that might be used in this system. We also used the USP665 solvents, uh, the PH3, PH10, and 50-50 ethanol water mixture. And lastly, we used saline. Similarly, we used the same solvent sets for our spray bottle system. Uh, for our siloxane tubing, though, we expanded that a little bit. Uh, we used a uh, phosphate buffered saline containing 10% albumin, as well as we used cell culture media as examples of leachables conditions. And then we used the same uh, set of solvents for our extractables, the pH3, pH10, 50-50 water ethanol, and saline. So the extractions were then performed using those solvents, but we did that in the case of the pill bottle by doing a full fill extraction. And we did it at 50 C for 72 hours with 50 RPM uh, stirring. And um, same uh, general condition for our, our leachables. Uh, the spray bottle, um, in order to get all of the parts, the wetted parts, to be um, in contact with the liquid, we did have to do a cut and cover for this because there's no way to constantly simulate the pumping action. So uh, again, after we did the cut and cover, we did it at 50 C for 72 hours at 50 RPM. And then uh, same for our leachables. And for our tubing, uh, we initially began this um, by doing a recirculated extraction where we wanted to flow the liquid through, but we found that the tubing, in fact, uh, was porous to the 50-50 ethanol uh, water extraction medium. And so per US 665, we were able to instead use a cut and cover strategy for this. Uh, this was done at 40 C for 21 days at 50 RPM in keeping with USP 665. Uh, the draft guidance. And then um, similarly for the leachables, we did 37C for 21 days. All right, so now that we understand what we were analyzing and what, how we did the extractions, I now want to turn to the analytical workup. And uh, here, this slide just gives you an overview of the analytical methodologies that were applied. For general screening, we used UV Viz to look for chromophore containing species, things like uh, aromatic compounds. We did FTIR on the extracts that um, did not contain a large amount of salt. And um, we used that to get a general screen of the overall types of functional groups that are present. We did gravimetric analysis to look for the weight of extractables. And TOC was done on the salt containing solutions to look for the total amount of organic in those. Uh, for identification and quantification of individual extractables and leachables, we used ICPMS. Uh, for um, elemental metals, and we also used um, QTOF GCMS and QTOF LCMS to do identification of organic extractables and leachables. We then finally used triple quad MS, both triple quad GC and triple quad LC, to do quantitation of targeted analytes. Here is the results from our gravimetric analysis and TOC work, and you can see that in the pill bottle with childproof cap, we found just a couple milligrams. Uh, in the strongest extraction uh, condition, which was our 50-50 water ethanol. And uh, we did not find any measurable mass by TOC in the acid, base, or PBS buffers. Uh, in the spray bottle, we found a little bit more than we had found in the pill bottle. We found about 4.5 milligrams in the 50-50 water ethanol. And then, uh, and then we found a, a relatively significant mass in the acid extract as well. Uh, in the tubing, we found uh, a, a little bit in the 50-50 water ethanol, and then we found some in all of the other extracts as well. So the tubing uh, seems to leach uh, more consistently, irregardless of the medium that was used. Here are the UV Viz results. Uh, in terms of the, um, the silicon tubing extract, we see that we do get some absorbance up at 240 to 250 um, nanometers, and that means there is aromaticity uh, in some of these um, uh, extracts. And so we can see that, um, in fact, there is actually some in all three of the extracts, the acid base and 50-50 ethanol water. This is an example of the FTR results that was obtained um, from the silicon tubing with the 50-50 uh, water ethanol. And we can see that th we get a strong match for, um, uh, for silicones. This is a D5 siloxane standard is giving us a strong match to the material we're finding in our extract. So that's a strong 
um, indication that we're going to find silicone extractables from the silicon tubing, which makes sense. Okay, so in terms of mass spectroscopy, uh, we used a variety of techniques, as I mentioned, to do the identification of individual extractables and leachables. And the reason we do that is because we want to capture the full breadth of the type of materials that may be present. So for very volatile compounds, we used headspace gas chromatography mass spectroscopy, uh, in this case, um, dynamic headspace. We also used um, QTOF GCMS for volatile compounds and semi-volatiles. We used QTOF LCMS for our non-volatiles and ionizable species. And lastly, we use ICPMS for elemental analysis. In terms of our ICPMS results, we used a, um, an Angelin 7900 ICPMS, which allows us to look at solutions which contain a high salt concentration, up to 25% dissolved solids. And so uh, that instrument uh, allows us to analyze those samples without any dilution. So as you can see here in this slide, uh, in some of these cases, we have uh, thousands um, or even tens of thousands of uh, micrograms per mil of salt that we're analyzing without diluting so that we can still get very low detection limits because of that high matrix introduction capability. And here are the results. Um, I've highlighted uh, some of the elements that are uh, of interest in USP 232, the elements of greatest concern as well as two elements that were interesting just for these particular samples, the silicon and phosphorus. And what we see is that in general we have very low levels of metals extracting out of the tubing. Uh, we do see a significant level of silicone, which is as we would expect given that this was a silicon tubing. And uh, we did see a, a little bit of phosphorus as well. And so um, it becomes interesting to figure out what that is and where that, why that is in this sample. Uh, so now I want to take you into the heart of my talk, and I want to talk to you a little bit about the sample preparation phase. Um, sample prep is the unsung hero of analytical chemistry. If you don't do good sample prep, you will not get good results. And so uh, it's very important to, um, to consider carefully the steps that we use in sample prep and to make sure that we're doing that in a way that does not give us artifacts. And so we're going to look at three specific types of sample prep. We're going to look at sample concentration, we're also going to look at liquid-liquid extraction, and then we're going to look at storage conditions and how those affect the number of extractables and leachables that we observe. So first off, uh, let's talk about sample concentration. And I like to begin by asking the question, why do we do this? So the reason we concentrate samples is because we want to hit a particular analytical evaluation threshold, or AET value. And so many times in order to hit that value, you have to first concentrate your sample. So this is done by concentrating and removing solvent. And the idea is that the analyte will remain because the solvent is more volatile than the analyte. But that is, of course, an assumption. And so um, you can either do that to dryness and then bring that back up to a known volume, or you can just partially concentrate it, never take it to dryness, and stop at some set volume. And we're going to compare the, and contrast those two and ask which one's better, or do both cause loss of analytes. But let's keep in mind that sample concentration is always risky, because any time we do it, if we have a volatile analyte, that analyte may be lost. Um, normally, if we think about the way that analytical chemistry is typically done, we would cover this by doing a validation. And in that validation, we would ask the question, is any of my analyte lost by doing a recovery experiment? The problem is, in extractables and leachables analysis, because we're screening, we don't know what's there, we can't spike, because we don't know what to spike. So it's important that we know that our methodology well covers this issue um, because compounds may be lost and we could not know it. So here's some actual data from our current study in which we've taken the, um, the PE bottle and, uh, and spray bottle extract in the 50-50 ethanol water. And we have concentrated that both to dryness and brought it back up and concentrated it tenfold and not taken it to dryness. The red chromatogram shows the one that was concentrated to dryness, the blue, the one that was concentrated tenfold. The purple extra, uh, chromatogram is the unconcentrated extract. And we did dilute these all back to the same concentration, so an equal peak area equals an equal concentration. And as you can see, in both cases, a compound was lost. And that compound in this case was 2,4-ditert-butylphenol, which is a known antioxidant degradant. And, um, and so here's a perfectly good example of a, of a true extractable that's present in this extract but that is lost during the concentration step. I would point out as well that this compound has a boiling point of 265 degrees C. 
So it is not a very low boiling compound or what we would typically think is a highly volatile compound. It's actually a semi-volatile. And so it is very important that we consider carefully concentration because this is a good example of a real compound that's lost. So um, we tried to overcome this by running Headspace, uh, which is an orthogonal method to GCMS, which is the data I was just showing. And as you can see here, we don't see the 2,4-diterpbutylphenol in this particular extract. And so um, our orthogonal methodology that's meant to capture the volatiles was not good enough for this semi-volatile. And so this compound truly would have been lost if we had just concentrated and run uh, in this particular study. So what we then did was we then chose to do a targeted method using our GC triple quad system. Uh, this is a highly sensitive instrument, uh, one of the uh, most sensitive instruments for GC quantitation. And as you can see, um, we did a spiking study, we got a good recovery value, and we were able to show that this material is present at 86 part per billion. Um, so it's at a very low level. So that is why we, one of the good reasons we didn't see it in the headspace analysis, because our headspace is not as sensitive as, um, as this is here. So um, again, a really good example of, of how we need to be careful in sample prep, because that compound would have been lost it would not have been obvious that it was lost. So one of the things we do in our laboratory to help um, deal with this issue is we run uh, exclusively GCQTOFs for our ENL studies. The GCQTOF is more sensitive than most GCs. Uh, it generally has um, uh, sensitivity in the 100 part per billion range. And so we're able to pick up these compounds as we did this one uh, on that instrument. And so that allows us to avoid having to do the sample concentration. And that's one of the ways we deal with this issue. So, in summary, sample concentration improves your detection limits, but it's at a risk. And that risk is that we may lose compounds of interest. Um, if you do concentration, make sure to concentrate both the sample and the control so that you have uh, an equal uh, ability to see background components and to rule those out. It is a good idea to use an orthogonal method, such as Headspace GCMS, but keep in mind that their sensitivities are different, and therefore that may not solve the problem entirely. Uh, it, lastly, when possible, don't concentrate and instead use a highly sensitive instrument like a GCQTOF to get better results and bring less potential error into your study. All right, with that said, let's turn our attention now to liquid liquid extraction, which is the next uh, type of sample prep we want to cover today. So, why do we do liquid liquid extraction? Well, to begin with, we do this method because not all solvents can be analyzed directly on all instrumentation. If we want to analyze a solvent by GCMS, we can't typically have a lot of water or a non-volatile solvent around. So we have to do a liquid-liquid ex extraction to get it into a more suitable medium. So typically, uh, you know, we will have to extract water with a solvent like hexane or dichloromethane or isooctane to get it ready to go onto the GC. Similarly, in liquid chromatography, solvents like hexane and dichloromethane are not suitable. They're not miscible with the LC solvents. And so instead, we will have to get them into a form where they can be analyzed through some kind of liquid-liquid extraction process. So just like as in uh, our concentration, we have the risk of loss, here, so too, we have a risk of loss. If we're transferring from one solvent to another, the possibility exists that the partition coefficient will be such that the compound will want to stay in the organic phase and not migrate to the aqueous phase and then be lost in an LC analysis. Or similarly, if we're transferring from an aqueous phase to a, a nonpolar phase for GC, it may not transfer there either. So it becomes important whether the compounds can move from the one solvent to the other effectively. So as I mentioned earlier, normally if in typical analytical chemistry situations, we would cover this with a validation where we would verify that our compound is successfully moved through a recovery experiment. But again, keep in mind, we can't do that in ENL analysis because of the fact that we don't know what we're looking for, we're screening. So uh, this slide shows the analytical workflow that we're going to use for this set of experiments. On the, in the standard case, we're going to do an, our, um, an extraction on our acid and base extracts uh, by liquid liquid extraction and then analyze them by a GCMS. In the second case, we're going to add one additional step. We're going to do the acid-base extraction. We're then going to pH adjust that extract. So if it's acidic, we're going to make it basic. If it's basic, we're going to make it acidic. And then we're going to do our liquid-liquid extraction and analysis by GCMS. Now, why does this matter? 
Well, it matters because we know that ionic compounds are not going to transfer to a nonpolar phase if they're in the ionized form. So if we have a, an extraction where we've done an acid extract, we're going to tend to extract bases. But because that extract is in an acidic form, those compounds are not going to transfer and therefore not be seen. And that means the compounds that are most likely to be extracted will be missed. Similarly, if we have an acid extract, uh, excuse me, a, a basic extract, we're going to extract acids most likely. Those compounds will be in a, in a negatively charged state, and they will not want to go into the nonpolar phase either. And this makes pH adjustment very important. OK, so here's some real data showing uh, a, an extract. And what you can see here is that if we start with the blue chromatogram, that is a, base, a basic extract of our, of our spray bottle. And we then analyze that after doing liquid extraction. And what you see is we don't detect any components uh, in that particular mixture. If we, on the other hand, um, do the, uh, the basic or the pH adjustment of that basic extract, and then we analyze it instead, you can see that we now see benzoic acid where we previously did not. So um, in both cases, we do see the butylated hydroxytoluene and the phenol, but only after pH adjustment do we see the benzoic acid because that molecule would be in an ionized state in a basic extract. In the acidic extract, uh, similarly, if we don't pH adjust, we will see benzoic acid because it's in the neutral state. But if we do pH adjust, we will lose that compound. So it's important to make sure that we understand which kind of compounds we're looking for and that we adjust accordingly. Uh, so here, this slide just re uh, emphasizes the charge state that each molecule would be in based on which uh, pH the solution was and helps understand why we lose uh, the benzoic acid. But if you look at the other compounds, uh, you can see they don't have those ionizable functional groups, so they don't get affected by the pH in the same way. OK, so let's summarize our, our um, concerns and, and best practices for liquid-liquid extraction. So um, when doing liquid-liquid extraction, uh, we want to make sure that we do not have the molecule in a charged state. And therefore, we want to make sure that if we're extracting with acid um, and we're likely to get bases out, that we pH adjust. And similarly, uh, when doing a basic extract. Um, keep in mind uh, that you should consider uh, using pH adjustment to confirm that nothing is lost. And also, I would mention, too, that using orthogonal methods is, again, a good double check. Because if we're using orthogonal methods, uh, if we're running GC and LC simultaneously, we're less likely to miss something if it is, in fact, not extracting out successfully. Because usually, we are looking at the instruments have opposite strengths, LC being very good for polars, GCB being very good for nonpolars. All right, so last condition I want to look at today is our storage conditions. So every time you do an extraction, um, you want to get it on the instruments as fast as you can, but you can't always get everything done immediately. It's not possible. It's not practical. So um, that means you're going to have to store that extract. And so we're going to look at how does the storage condition affect the extractables and leachables profile. Um, and we want to see if any different unknowns are lost or if concentrations are changing. So in this particular study, we did uh, some extractions with immediate analysis. And then we did some extractions in which we held the extracts for 10 days at both ambient, refrigerated, and uh, freezer conditions. And uh, analyzed the extracts to confirm if anything changed. And what you can see here in this chromatogram, um, this is a GCMS chromatogram. And you can see that the tubing 50-50 ethanol water extract, uh, in fact, didn't change significantly uh, under any of these conditions, be it ambient, fridge, or freezer. Uh, all of the uh, profiles remain the same over the 10-day period of interest. Now, this, of course, is just for this particular extract. This doesn't verify that it would never change. But it is encouraging to see that we have some reasonable period of time over which we can analyze this extract before we get any loss. Similarly, if we look at the LCMS chromatogram, we also did not see any significant change here either um, over the 10-day period under any of the three storage conditions that we looked at, um, which is, again, a very encouraging outcome. OK, so with that, I'd like to summarize and, um, and just hit the high points of my talk. So uh, first off, with sample concentration, remember that compound loss can occur. Uh, the best approach for doing analysis um, is to use sensitive instruments 
rather than concentration steps wherever possible so that we mitigate the, the risk that something's going to be lost during that concentration step. With regards to liquid-liquid extraction, consider compound ionizability when doing liquid-liquid extraction. And make sure that if you are going to, um, going to do a liquid-liquid extraction, that you have correctly pH adjusted because extracts tend to either bring out bases or acids depending on the pH of the extract solution. Make sure that your compound is in the non-ionized form and that's when it will extract successfully. Lastly, with sample storage, um, it is still best practice to analyze extracts promptly. Over many, uh, many years, decades of doing ENL analysis, I have seen cases where compounds will degrade over time in an ENL extract. Uh, so the, the best practice is always analyze them promptly, but a limited storage period does seem reasonable based on uh, these results as well as um, decades of results um, that I have had personally with doing ENL analysis in general. And of course, it's practically required because you can't always run them immediately. Lastly, I will continue to, um, to suggest orthogonal methods. Running multiple techniques is one of our, our best um, ways to prevent missed compounds in an extractables and leachables study and therefore to get um, an incorrect assessment of toxicological safety. Lastly, I wanted to just mention there is another uh, companion webinar to this one. If you enjoyed this webinar, let me refer you to my colleague Kevin Rowland, our laboratory manager. He is going to be presenting on advanced identification methods in extractables and leachables analysis. And he's going to be showing a lot on how we do uh, something called differential analysis, which is a very powerful tool for identifying extractables and leachables out of complex matrices and also for looking at extractables and leachables over time in things like stability studies. So with that, I'd just like to thank you uh, for your attention, and I'd also like to thank all of my colleagues who did a lot of the work that you saw today uh, and allowed us to put this presenta presentation together for you. Thank you.